Welcome to our talk, Art at Times of War, and about the common task of um, supporting artists and preventing um, cultural identity. And um, it's a co-organized talk um, by Willkommenskultur, um, Berlin Culture Supports Arts in Exile, and by Vice. Um, and um, with us are my colleagues Johannes and Eva. Um, Johannes and I um, are part of Willkommenskultur, and Eva is a um, founding member of Vice and also the director of the um, theater festival in Lviv. And um, next, I just wanted to introduce Vice to you guys because um, it's an organization of young Ukrainians here in Berlin or in Germany. Um, and they, um, through events and also um, promoting Ukrainian artists, um, they work um, on to counteract the um, eradication of, of um, Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian identity by the Russian war of um, um, aggression. And um, Eva, to my left here, will take, uh, will take you on a little tour through Ukrainian culture history and to show you that there have been several attempts through, throughout the history um, on part of uh, Russia to destroy Ukrainian culture and um, Ukrainian identity. And um, yeah, I will hand over to her now. Hi everyone, it's amazing to see you all here in this uh, great day, the day uh, after the huge important day in Ukraine today. Yesterday we have celebrated a return of our identity. Uh, independency and identity as well, I think. And today my task will be to tell you more about culture in Ukraine, so that you will see, you can see even the name of uh, this on the slide. And um, when I was thinking how to tell about the culture in Ukraine, we can, uh, uh, of course, speak about the music, about uh, how everything bright, and that the people, uh, even in the really... Um, oppressive condition was continuing to stand up to create. But unfortunately, um, the main, how to say, metaphor to this will be genocide. The genocide, as the term was invented by Rafael Lemkin, he was Polish, uh, Polish Jew lawyer who um, has invented that after he has uh, survived the Second World War and the Holocaust. And um, he has also planned to do this in a bright concept, but unfortunately, it was not uh, it was not done. So basically, leaders decided to skip uh, the whole concept as he has proposed that, and cut this. And mostly because Stalin said that. Uh, Rafael Lemkin also want to have cultural genocide in the term in ge as genocide, uh, but unfortunately Stanet, Stalin banned that, and he has uh, a right to do this because he was represented Soviet Union, who has also conquered uh, conquer, conquered Nazis. What does it mean, culture genocide, in the understanding of Rafael Lemkin? So basically, it's sports assimilation, suppression of a language or culture activities to destroy a group. And mostly, the, what does it mean, how we can understand it? It's with the intent to destroy a group as a part of an effort to implement a year zero. So basically to erase everything, to say that it was nothing there, it has nothing exist before, and uh, basically to do this history reset, because how we understand when we think what, does, what, what is culture, like, yeah, for the group of people, for the, for the country, for the uh, people who understand them, who are making choice to be the part of this culture. Uh, basically, the culture, then history, and it's building the identity, basically. And when you're taking away some part, like, I mean, culture or history, you are making much more easier to destroy, to erase these people. And when we think in the most, um, like, not the obvious, but mostly typical act of cultural genocide will be burning of the books. And uh, we know this picture, and uh, it was actually quite, how to say, 
typical image how basically Russian Federation before Soviet Union and before Russian and before Moscow Imperial was uh, destroying Ukrainian culture, making culture genocide. Because, um, I will jump to the next slide uh, already, because uh, they started to do this in 7th century. So I have prepared you, I will not read everything what is written on this slide because it's crazy. If you want, you can make a photo. Uh, it's uh, about the linguocid. It's also part of cultural genocide, basically how they taken away the language. Uh, right now, a lot of people, and even if you meet Ukrainians or I think you have met uh, this conversation between the, like some person who came from Ukraine and uh, some uh, international person who don't know Ukraine so well. They started to speak in Russian, like "Привет" and "Как дела." But basically, uh, why they started this with Russian language, not with Ukrainian language, which is different, um, because it's the consequences of this action started from 17th century and they started this with the of course burning the books which was written in ukrainian so it was 17th century then we go to the 18th century uh, with the peter first actually started the most the hugest repression in russian empire against uh, ukraine as it is and against ukrainian culture then we go to the 19th century, and here, uh, like you see, how how much was done to erase language, not just to burn the books, but also destroyed uh, schools, which was making lessons in Ukrainian, uh, like uh, even schools which was uh, speaking about Ukrainian history, everything what they can do, and of course pushing people to speak just Russian to erase this identity to make more like easy. To to say that it uh, doesn't exist such country as Ukraine. And um, the most uh, important, I think, uh, to go to this 1863, it's Circular, So basically, um, it declared with the very important sentence, which actually continued to, uh, Russian Federation used right now, there was, is, not, and could not have been a separate Malaruski language. Basically, they using uh, Malaruski, Malarosia, when they speaking about Ukrainian language, because like they, when we translate directly Malaruski, it's like a small Russian. And um, right now, when we uh, like, why it's quite important to, unfortunately, when we speak about the culture uh, of Ukraine and culture in Ukraine, it's quite important also to see how actually it's continuing to repeat itself. Then we go to 20th century. The 20th century, uh, some people think that uh, like Ukrainian culture and the Ukrainian as a country started to be just then and precisely uh, in 1991, so just 31 years ago. But basically we are saying that it's uh, the Independence Day, but uh, like a returning point, that like it's returning of independency. And um, in um, like 19... 40, 14, I'm sorry, it started like this movement to make Ukraine as a country because uh, during this uh, centuries it was all the time like Kozaki which was uh, continuing to have Ukrainian culture even and Ukrainian language uh, trying to do their own schools and uh, before it was the huge history with this uh, like trying to um, resist this political raising, but the most important will go to the 20th century because when uh, Ukraine decided to declare like uh, Ukrainian independence as a country, uh, Soviet Union uh, started to exist with the Lenin, who right now declaring as the founder of Ukraine, a creator of Ukraine. Uh, but unfortunately, he invaded Ukraine back then, like the country then, because we know the 20th century and the First World War as the period when the imperial was falling down. And basically, it should happen with Russia as well. But basically, the imperial just uh, changed, like it started to be imperial and dictatorship of the party. Uh, and they even was uh, like declaring that. And when they invade uh, Kyiv, uh, they started to 
erased Ukrainian and Ukrainian culture in three steps. First was, and um, first was, I will jump to the other slide, because right now I just repeating the famous selection by done by Rafael Lemkin in New York in 1953 as he escaped um, uh, Ukraine because as we know Ukraine was invaded uh, after the Poland uh, part in Ukra of Ukraine already with the Poland was invaded uh, by Nazi and of course he needs to run from this continent and he has luck to get uh, America and there he started to his work to understand how we can explain how we can um, show how we can articulate what was happening in the Second World War and what actually humanity has done and how to declare this in the lawyer process. And um, unfortunately, as the best example of genocide, he has used Soviet genocide in Ukraine. And here in QR code, you can get the original election done by Rafael Lemkin, that you can not believe me just what I'm saying in the words, you can check this by yourself. And uh, he said that Soviet genocide in Ukraine was in three steps. The first was, it was intelligentsia. And what does it mean, intelligentsia? So it's teachers, it's writers, it's artists, it's engineers, everyone who was declaring themselves as Ukrainian. As we know, Ukraine uh, has, is completely multicultural, it's Crimean Tatarian, it's Jewish people, Polish, we have the huge, actually, um, villages of Germans and so on, like a uh, huge amount of differences. But uh, like the people was chosen to be Ukrainians and those one who has chose this was, um, was like Soviet Union started to kill all of them. And uh, in 1918, when uh, Soviet uh, U Soviet's army invaded Kyiv after some period as uh, everything was done, and unfortunately back then Ukraine uh, lost this war, uh, after some time they opened like uh, um, public spaces as schools, as uh, prisons, and it was a huge amount of blood everywhere. There was just taking people and killing them. Everybody, everyone who was creating like this, uh, like uh, first Ukrainian government state as itself to declare just Ukraine as Ukraine. The next step was uh, to erase the, um, like mostly priests, the church, because church back then it was the, uh, as here as well, it was the space where actually people could be educated in Ukrainian, they was writing in Ukrainian and so on. So basically it was also kind of like culture spot where Ukrainian culture uh, was continuing to resist. Then they uh, raised them, killed them, and then it was peasants. The most uh, known act of genocide in Ukraine, it was Holodomor uh, in 1932-33. But it was not the one Holodomor, it was in three steps. It was 20 to 23 when Lenin was on the power, then it was 30 to 33 when the Stalin was ready, and then um, 41, 42. And uh, Rafael Emkin said that, like uh, this, the most known genocide uh, as Holodomor was just the culmination of the, of the whole process of the Soviet genocide in Ukraine. But when we are speaking about the resisting of uh, culture and the culture in Ukraine, and unfortunately culture genocide in Ukraine, we need to also raise attention to the executed renaissance, what it was. When the Soviets came, first they was trying, after what they have done in the prisons in Kyiv, they was trying to pretend that they support in Ukrainian culture, that they support in Ukrainians, they have made this politic of colonization, so back to roots, uh, supporting Ukrainian culture. And uh, to understand what does it mean, we can uh, imagine Budinok Slovo. It's the building ex it, which existed because right now Russian Federation destroyed this building, but uh, before 24th February it was existed. The building, uh, which named uh, Slovo Ward, uh, direct translation from Ukrainian language, and uh, there uh, they 
have given opportunity to Ukrainian like artists to live there for free so they can create. But in the end, they kill everybody who lived there when they finish this politic. And uh, part of them was also part of executed renaissance. In that time, as it was like in each, um, like in theater, in literature, in music, in visual art, it was the huge wave of Ukrainians because like they was creating, like uh, they was again trying to resist with their own culture. And then one by one they was killed, erased. And here we see the picture from Sandermach. It's the most huge tragedy for our culture. Uh, where everybody one by one was killed. It's uh, territory of Russian Federation now. And unfortunately, it's also part of culture genocide and what we have lost and this like, this empty spots, it's so many that it's difficult to describe and to understand even. And um, then we go to the 21th century, it should be good, but uh, like because we have our independence and we all declare uh, the world as democratic world, but unfortunately, it's history repeated itself. In 2014, in occupied region, after the Russia started the war against Ukraine, in so named Russian, uh, in so named uh, Luhansk um, and Donetsk People Republic, and as well in Crimea, uh, Ukrainian language uh, has been suppressed. And then we're returning back to this uh, the most visible and the most. Um, how to say powerful? I don't. It's not the word powerful for that, but it's again um, in 2022 we see burning of Ukrainian books in occupied by Russians, Mariupol. So you see the picture. So mostly it was the books in Ukrainian or about Ukrainian history, but it's about the books. It's about the language mostly. Uh, what is happening right now with the cultural heritage, like because. We can imagine that uh, during the Soviet Union, the all like culture building was uh, um, even if it was like Ukrainian building that was changed like the uh, Soviet genocide, so, uh, Soviet heritage, and uh, it means Russian heritage. But after Ukraine uh, declare again return back uh, the independence, like the old buildings was uh, the history was. Um, Rethink, uh, it was uh, the open archives and see the whole whole culture history. But uh, right now, this building, for example, as this b uh, building of library and historical monument, so the library in uh, Chernihiv region from 19th century, right now looks like that. So basically, um, we can see on the next slide, we can use also QR code and goes to Google, uh, to the map where we can see uh, how and where 450 cultural landmarks have been destroyed or damaged uh, during the fight, including 34 museums. So uh, this uh, map prepared the Ukrainian Culture Foundations. They present them and they call for action to protect uh, like historical building. One of them, for example, is uh, Grigory Skorda House Museum. It's in Kharkiv. It looks like that right now, but Skorda is continuing to stand, as always. Then we see what... Uh, unfortunately, we don't have more picture from Mariupol, so it, uh, this picture was made like in the first uh, weeks of the full-scale invasion. Uh, we don't see and don't know what is happening right now with this Koinji Art Museum, but we for sure know that all uh, piece of art by Koinji is stolen to Russia. Then we can see how looks uh, Ivan Kim Historical and Local History Museum in uh, Kyiv, uh, its Kyiv region. And uh, in this uh, historical museum was uh, um, um, were works done by Maria Primachenko and by luck and by huge courage of the uh, security of this museum, uh, the almost all works was uh, saved. So basically the guy uh, just ran to the fire and uh, saved this uh, works. It's amazing courage of this 
a person who said, uh, like, I cannot imagine that I will not do anything what it takes to save these uh, works. Then we go to the Baben Yar Holocaust Memorial Complex. Uh, it was also bombed. We can see the, on the picture how it was bombed. Precisely, they know where they are shooting. And then uh, the most important of this, uh, not the most important, but um, very important to say that um, about the um, uh, archaeological site Kamiana Mohila, it's in Melitopol right now, it's uh, occupied again. And uh, here we see um, the place which actually proved how long Ukrainian culture and like uh, the roots of Ukrainians, because uh, it's like still not discovered enough because Soviet Union has uh, not given permission to do this uh, for Ukrainian archaeologists, of course, because it uh, could uh, open a lot of um, pages of history which could prove that Ukraine has existed for the long, long time. And right now, unfortunately, we also don't have the picture from now because it's occupied, but right now they bomb and then is this almost all the time to destroy it, everything what we can get from this space. And like I used this picture, it's actually the book done by Alexander Dovzhenko, Ukraine in Ukraine in Fire. And it's basically uh, how looks Ukrainian culture uh, right now. And so what we see, we see that uh, they are trying to do this year zero. And it was done through the whole se centuries. We have, like, we have seen how it was in 17th century, how they have started the whole process of destroying, erasing Ukrainian uh, culture and Ukrainian language by burning the, burning the books. And it's continuing to happen. And for example, uh, very iconic uh, moment, it's uh, actually this work done by Alexander Hryekhov, our pop art artist, um, Ukrainian artist. Uh, but he has made the picture of um, Shoot It monument of Taras Shevchenko, one of the famous Ukrainian writers. Yeah, Ukrainian trying to protect this, like the democratic uh, way of trying to protect this heritage and the right for existence of the culture of Ukraine. But unfortunately, uh, it's really difficult because it bombs. It's completely as the city in Ukraine erasing as uh, we can think about the city as Volnovakha or Shchastya. The city was so bombed uh, during these eight years and now as well that they don't exist anymore. So basically it's just the ground and destroying buildings. And the same is happening in the culture. So today uh, I could speak about the art, about the theater, how brilliant our theater was that in 1920 our dramaturgist Volodymyr Venechenko has made her, his couple performance in Volksbühne. Or I can speak about the arsenal, which actually named by the work of Dovzhenko here in uh, Potsdamer Platz. I can tell you how Kobylanska was writing in German and uh, she was quite also very popular here and in uh, Austria as well. But today, because of reality, I told you about the culture genocide. It started a long time ago and it's continuing to be right now. And we need help to heal our Taras Shevchenko and our culture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva, for this insight. It's very interesting and also shocking. And that leads us also to the second part, because that's also the feeling that we, we have, and probably we share that feeling with some of the people here in the room. The question is, what can we do now, and how can we get active? I would ask you to go to the next slide. And um, sometimes we feel even powerless due to to the complexity of the situation. So the question is, how can we as also Germans or Western Europeans be active 
and um, that's the part where, that we want to address now in six different fields and want to talk about what are fields of action that we can actually take right now. And there's one general tip because you are here right now. Um, if you want to help Ukraine and you don't know how, talk to the Ukrainians and especially talk to the people of Vice because the people of Vice also in their social media give a lot of hints on how to do that. And um, Jana and I are going to present you some of these main fields of action together. Um, I just wanted to shortly talk about um, what is Willkommenskultur because um, we talked about what is Vice and you saw what they are doing and working on right now. Jana and I are working on Willkommenskultur and we did a series also of events where Ukrainian cultural actors and German cultural actors could meet. And we're trying to promote also Ukrainian culture in Germany and especially in Berlin. So I will give you the first uh, point, which is information sources. Yeah, so first of all, um, um, I can just, you know, I would uh, say that all of you should definitely follow Vice because um, they have two channels on Instagram. It's uh, Vice.culture um, and Vice unterstrich Berlin. And there you get all the information you need because first of all, um, they are organizing, as I already said, a lot of events um, to, you know, explain what is actually happening in the Ukraine right now and also to support um, the artists uh, who are still there and the artists that had to flee the country. Um, this is um, one simple thing everyone can do because as Johannes already think I uh, said, I think many times um, one is so, you know, stroked by uh, the mountain of information um, you got, but it's also the little things you can do to help the situation and you know follow like the right people on Instagram and support them and um, share their event events share their information go to the events is a big part and then um, Eva and Katja also sitting here um, also said it's very important that you um, you know use the right sources of information and um, they wrote down um, as you can see um, a few um, blogs and, and, and um, newspapers you can follow that um, keep you in the loop of what is happening there. And they all have like Twitter accounts um, that um, publish the most important um, facts. Um, so it helps you to keep like the dialogue and the conversation alive because I think this is really important that, um, you know, you don't let the war to become the new normal and you keep like the conversation up um, with your friends, with your family and for that you need the right information and those are like some um, quotes of information that you can trust and that you can get your information from. And that leads us directly to the second field of action which is the direct communication and contact. And those are just a few hints that we wrote down but the most important message that we want to get out, don't just talk about Ukraine, talk with Ukrainians. Um, communicate directly with Ukrainians, be curious, don't hesitate to talk with them also about what's going on the war and their situation. Um, if you don't understand some parts, ask people, ask people like Katya and Eva here, that can give you direct insights and also profound information. Jana already said it, keep the conversation going. We are, we are understanding now that the attention on the war is getting less and less in German media. So it's up to us to also talk with our friends, family, business partners, whomever, about what we can actually do to keep the conversation alive and going and the attention high. If you see, for example, on the streets here in Berlin, more and more also in the evenings, people are, um, are lost, they maybe have traumata, try to also approach them, help them, and as far as it is in your, um, in your power, and also direct them to different sources of help 
call eventually like the emergency or lead them to um, other helping organizations. If you see discrimination against uh, Ukrainians, that it's also happening regularly now, um, try to also intervene as much as you can without bringing yourself in danger, obviously. But it's also something that you have to keep an eye on um, nowadays when you roam Berlin. I will give to Jana and maybe you can go to the next page. Um, yeah, then it's also like, you know, joining protests and demo demonstrations that can be done online as well as offline. Um, first of all, um, Vice is doing um, um, in protest once once a month that you can join. Um, just yesterday they d did like a f huge, yeah, March for Freedom, I would say, um, and a lot of people joined, which is um, wonderful, but, you know, also this has to be keep on going. Um, so just go there and, and show support. And then also online, you know, um, share the right information, tag the right people, um, also right politicians, um, you know, if you have um, the time and, and also, you know, show your support on that level. Right now there are numerous events also organized by Ukrainians going on in Berlin. It's sometimes amazing cultural program and especially amazing communication. Try to join these events, find them, you, you can find them also. For example, through Vice, there are also different organizations that are promoting that right now. And check out especially Ukrainian artists that are in Berlin that are actually also creating new Ukrainian art right now. Um, because it's also important for us to show them attention to this uh, new developments. And there's one interesting aspect that's, that's happening um, currently quite often is that there are um, events about the war, about Ukraine and supporting Ukraine that are actually not involving Ukrainians in the organization. And that's sometimes an aspect that leads to either misinformation or even just um, also wrong image of the situation. And what's always reflected from us, uh, to us from uh, people from Ukraine, it's important that if you do an event on whatever scale that's about this topic involve Ukrainians in the organization in order to reflect also on the content. And um, if you see that an event is organized without um, Ukrainians joining, stress that also um, within your fields of power. Um, yeah, and then of course money is always <laughs> An important factor because um, all the organizations that do important work, um, they you know need the money to keep um, their work going. And um, so one organization um, we've um, continually talked about, and um, you know you can um, donate donate to with um, you know all your heart, and um, we can uh, tell you that you can trust those guys is Vice, and actually um, um, Pop Culture Festival is. Um, at the guest list, um, they ask the people to do donate to Vice as well. So this is definitely an organization um, that can need your money and um, it's a good invest um, to donate there. And then also um, Vice themselves are supporting Help Save Heroes in Ukraine, Stop Blood in Ukraine, which is also an organization um, that is doing um, very important work um, in the Ukraine. and. Um, why we like, you know, put the focus on those two organizations is because it's also very important that you donate to organizations that know what the need is because many times, um, you know, people want to help and then suddenly um, we start by collecting clothes again or whatever and this, those are not the things, you know, that are needed right now and even, you know, when it's the right cause, um, you need to know which ones are the people that actually have an overview of the situation and know on which points the money is needed. 
So the last field of action that we are going to talk about is how to support um, cultural actors that are now in, in Germany or especially in Berlin. Um, that's also including a small promotion for our platform that we, on web platform Willkommenskultur.Berlin that you can check out. Um, people and cult especially cultural actors need now jobs, opportunities, stages, paid gigs, but they also sometimes need, for example, basic things like equipment to make their music, to um, make their art, um, because often they come with just one suitcase and they have to leave their whole equipment behind, um, or they need guidance in how to enter, for example, the German market, and those are all things that are a little bit more, let's say, complex to do than the other things. But if you have um, any equipment that you don't need, or you have a you work in a company, you have a good job opportunity, you can, for example, use the platform Willkommenskultur.Berlin to post these kind of in inquiries, and then they're available to ac and accessible for Ukrainians and for refugees that come here in order to build also a life with their culture and their art here in Berlin. And um, that's important to stress that we and you try to welcome them as good as we can. I think that's from our side, that's it. And um, we like to thank you for your attention and open up for questions right now. We're gonna be around here a little bit more, so if you want to address us, uh, um, you know, you can also come up later on. We be like outside, and um, I would say let's finish with it. So thank you. <laughs>